You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Do you know what came out 50 years ago this week to absolutely no great acclaim? Do you know what it was? It was the Hunky Dory, wasn't it? It was the Hunky Dory. The Hunky Dory by David Bowie. Oh, David Bowie came came out uh, this week in 1971. And I've been looking at the chart. Well, you we've been looking at the chart. Actually. Well, you found this copy of Melody Maker from November uh, the thirteenth, nineteen seventy one. It's fantastic. You've got to do the chart first. So, I'll so tell you a few things I found. Okay, so so the I was surprised by a few things. I mean, at number one in the UK singles chart was what was still referred to as Reason to Believe, Stroke Maggie May. So they were still talking about Reason to Believe as being kind of. Kind of the lead side, yeah. you know that got that got really forgotten. It's got Witch Queen of New Orleans at number two, and Tired of Being Alone by Al Green at number three. So that's all very good. Have you got the albums? Rod Stewart is number one with every picture that tells a story. So that's the kind of breakthrough of Rod Stewart, isn't it? Really, with that record? Yeah, it is. And Imagine uh, number two, and Tapestry by Carol King at number. And number three, Teaser and the Fire Cat number five, uh, Electric Warrior number six, Mudslide Slim. Number seven, the Who. Who's next? Uh, number eight, and then Simon and Garfunkel, Bridge Over Trouble Water, still hanging on. But but the interesting thing is that um, you would have thought Hunky Dory would have gone somewhere in that chart. It didn't. Isn't Absolutely that astonishing. Didn't at all. It's it amazing how you 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 kind of reevaluate these things, don't you? Uh, you know, from today's perspective, just yeah. imagine these things arrived out of the box to tumultuous applause. It, it took really a really good, long time. It got really good reviews. <coughs> you know, it came. It actually charted over a year later when uh, Ziggy Stardust charted, and then they started re-promoting. You know, people people started buying the previous albums, but at the time it came out. Absolutely nothing at all. Although he got very good reviews, and you know he got he got played on the radio and things like uh, "Oh You Pretty Thing," I think it's "Oh You Pretty Thing." Yes, it is. Were um, Tony Blackburn's record of the week, which in those days was you know a significant. <laughs> yeah, that's a bold. That's a bold move on his part, isn't it? And uh, and but it didn't do anything at all, which is uh, surprising. So what struck you? Go on. Well, no, I was digging through. I was trying to find indications uh, that the world was ready for Hunky Dory, and I thought there were plenty. Because if you look at that album chart, Andy Williams' Greatest Hits is in there. There's a new story, which I thought was fantastic. Of a, of a charisma acts were banned from the Brighton Dome after people were, were dancing in the aisles at a Lindisfarne concert. <laughs> and uh, the dancing in the aisles was not allowed. And uh, the charisma people said they, they were so old-fashioned, they, they expect audiences to react as if listening to Dora Bryan or Ted Ray. So they banned Van de Graaff Generator, Audience, Genesis, and Bell and Ark from appearing at the Brighton Dome. That's very 1971, isn't it? You, know, you, you weren't allowed, you had to stay in your seats, you know. Uh, well, and people did. I mean, if you, yeah. take, you take the college gigs, you know, the bands were, oh, that, and that was the Led Zeppelin were playing, they kind of going back to the yeah. university tour. If you see pictures of that tour, which is Led Zeppelin in their pomp, they're all sitting the, down. Aren't the they? audience are entirely sitting, and not just sitting down. They're sitting cross-legged, cross-legged, <laughs> you know. and then politely clapping at the end. Yeah, of each politely song. clapping. Extraordinary. So, same edition of the Melody Maker has a full-page ad for the new Pink Floyd album, which is obviously which metal. is obviously metal. Yeah, uh, it's got little teaser ads for Led Zeppelin Four, which has turned up pretty much about about the same time. Now that's the other thing we're thinking about. Here's Led Zeppelin Four, which I've got in front of me. There it is. Is there any sign anywhere that it's called, it's by a group called Led Zeppelin, that it's A by a group, it's B by a group called Led Zeppelin, and it's their fourth album? Not a single slightest indication. Not remote. Nothing on the spine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing on the back. Absolutely nothing at all. Was that the beginning of the great inscrutable album cover um, thing, which I suppose still goes on to this day, you know, it's regarded as somehow cool to be able to put out a record that doesn't have any indication of the, of the kind of... Well, the Stone's dominant. first album didn't have their name on it, did it? Did it it didn't, which is very bold. In 1964, first Stone's album, wonderful picture. Yeah. And it's just got the four. And you, it's just got the five of them there. And you either knew who they were or you didn't. Um, yeah. but, but then again, if you turned it around, it's had the Rolling Stones quite clearly on the back. Uh, but I mean, even things like Sergeant Pepper, I can remember first seeing Sergeant Pepper in a record shop window thinking, who's that? 
because you know most record covers at the time were were pretty they spelled out you know what they were you know the new record by Tonto yeah called songs were well, we were in the court of the Crimson King that's a yeah. classic example you look at that there was, there's no indications who it was by or what it was no I mean, no don't think there's a name on it I think uh I think uh, music from the big from Big Pink was the same. But there's nothing Ram on the by b- McCartney. Music from Big Pink. There's nothing on the front, but it was on the back, wasn't it? In the um, wake of Poseidon, I don't think has. And I don't think Derek and the Dominoes Layla had anything apart from that strange picture on the front. Yeah, that's another really true. good one is Strange Days by the Doors. Oh right, yes. And possibly cool. Houses of the Holy. Actually, I'm just having a look. I've got some. Houses of the Holy had no indication on the outside. No indication at all. Um, I'll tell you the other one. I don't think. I think Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. I think they had a sticker on the front of it that said Pink Floyd Dark Side. It might have done. Yeah. On yeah. the actual album cover, yeah. there there would be there would be nothing at all. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's brilliant to look, to look at these uh, these old copies of the Melody Maker. And uh, oh, it's so funny that so there's a uh, there's Jonathan King has an interview with him talking about Johnny Reggae by the Piglets being at number oh, seventeen, yeah. <laughs> and he says it proves as an audience for bubblegum pop, which was kind of cruelly ignored by the music press. And then and I think one of us is talking to Chris Welsh does the uh, the singles reviews. And uh, he says one by the Baron Knights. He says it's another entertaining selection. It's so funny to think that in 1971, you know, the Melody Maker were taking the Baron Knights kind of see. I mean, actually, obviously, I love the Baron Knights, but it wasn't exactly the sort of thing you take seriously. There's a Ken Dodd single, and he says Ken Dodd sings nicely. And then there's a think piece about the Groundhogs. The, the headline was "Have we been unfair to the hogs?" And you think, my God, you know. What's, oh, there's a, and there's a little news story about how the flu has cancelled the Black Sabbath and Moody Blues gigs. Oh, right, so yes. the days when flu would cancel a tour. I tell you what there is also here, because it was obviously the week after. The, it's the week after the opening of the Rainbow in Finsbury Park. Oh, right. And, the rain, you know, the Who had played. I think the Who had opened it. You know, they had. Yeah, and, uh, and, and that was a very significant event. And the Rainbow was the... The concert venue of of, uh, of choice for for the next yeah. how long? I don't know, about four or five years. And uh, I saw loads of great shows at the Rainbow. But the thing that the um, the, the Chris Charlesworth reports on it um, in the Melody Maker, it says the evening was a show rather than a concert, which is very significant. Actually. Yeah, it, is. it did feel it different, is. you know. Uh, you know, Morris believes, and Morris was the guy who ran it. Uh, I can't remember. If it was, if, uh, I think it was Jonathan Morris or something. Yeah, Johnny Morris, anyway. Yeah. He believes that a band coming on to play and then going off again isn't enough. Hence, they have they had Can Can Girls, you know, with The Who. They had The Who and the most incredible light show I've ever seen. Do you remember that? Joe's Lights. Yeah, I do. They, they used to be on the posters. You used to say did. Joe's Lights. And you, Joe's you'd Lights. nod sagely and go, yeah, cool. But it was, <laughs> it was fantastic, the rainbow, because it was like, it was, a, you know, obviously an old cinema on the Finsbury Park Astoria. Yeah, uh, and it had been the place where all the package tours had started and finished. But um, <coughs> also, if you were upstairs at the Rainbow, you were you were directly opposite the um, the, the the fabulous decorations at the top of the stage, which were all like an, out of out of a, a thousand and one nights or something like you know you know how cinema design in the thirties. Yeah. Was always kind of looked as if Valentina was going to directly wander on, you know. Yes. It still looked like that in the Rainbow in in the early seventies when I saw, you know, Van Morrison and Little Feet and all these kind of people there. It's a fantastic place. So yeah, it's uh, fifty years ago since um, since it was opened in in its great rock phase. Of course, it was only yeah, the rock phase for quite a long short period of time. But for people like you and me, every time you go past the rainbow, it's the rainbow. Oh, it's God. not the Finsbury Park Astoria. No, it's no. not. It's not a, a kind of temple that it is nowadays. It's it's the rainbow because that's what it was for about five years. Five Never years really gone. significant. It's a fantastic place. The Word Podcast: Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. Now we read with concern that uh, Adele has thrown the vinyl pack uh, the vinyl manufacture business into disarray by ordering allegedly five hundred thousand copies of her new album. And we wanted to hear that people are tearing their hair out about this. We wanted to know what that actually meant. So we'd gone to an old friend of the pod and and the man behind the record label, the vinyl record label, playing groovy, Chris Topham. Hello, Chris. We meet you at 
playing groovy headquarters, don't we? You do. It's usually up in uh, Islington, but <laughs> here, right. I, here I am. And then this is where you you keep everything and you send it out to uh, you know to, to people who buy your records. Yeah, it's a combination of uh, here I fulfil. We have a, a thing called Investors Club, people who who regularly buy plain groovy releases. Um, but everything else is run by the, the amazing Burning Shed up in Norwich. Uh, oh, they, right. They run my online store now because it's it's just all got too big for one person really. So how long ago did you start playing groovy? It must oh, be ten well, years now. It's it's just over ten years ago. Yeah. Right, um, so so give us a picture of the kind of vinyl business nowadays in terms of this story about Adele, you know, yeah. ordering 500,000 copies and I, everybody I, else saying they can't get anything manufactured. Is that true? His, your your message yesterday to say, was I around today, was, was so timely because here I'll, I'll just very briefly read out a, a bit of a message that I sent out two days ago. Um, some more ugliness this week. Uh, our album was scheduled to press at GZ on the 2nd of November. Usually I receive albums shrink-wrapped, but this one's being delivered as component parts because there's a 12-page booklet with it. Uh, on the morning of the 2nd, which was the manufactured day, I was told that although everything was ready, the album would not catch the Tuesday lorry because various components were not all yet together. On Friday, I was told the album wasn't in the Friday lorry either. On Monday, not going to be on the Tuesday lorry, but this would be on an extra lorry departing Wednesday. Yesterday, which was Wednesday, this quote directly from GZ, the manufacturer, to DMS, my broker. I'm so sorry, but these shipments are not ready for today's truck. I can't give you more info because I don't have it. I don't know how to explain for everyone. We can't send these shipments because we don't have them at shipping department. Same story for every customer's right now. I can't, basic... do more, I can't do more from my position. Have a nice day. <laughs> That's great. The, the basic problem is there's a vinyl shortage, right? Isn't I'll just to say the last bit that I put here was maybe the lorries are full of Adele and Ed Sheeran albums. Right. That's, that, that's exactly what I put two days ago. So yeah, so we can't believe that really that that, that Adele has five hundred thousand vinyl editions of her album printed up. So that no, really is people are buying kind of hard copies, as it were, uh, because it's a it's, it's an event and it's a gift, isn't it? Is that right? Is it just it's, fashionable to do it? Partly that. I mean, compare it to, I, I'm not exactly sure what formats Adele has done, but I know the Spice Girls have just reissued their Spice World album in five different colours representing the five different girls of Spice. Uh, I think three different cassettes or something like, I mean, it, it's, this is marketing gone mad. Well, it's um, the completest market, isn't it? It, it is. And, it, yeah. and it, it's preying on people who will buy to complete. There's no, there's no, there's no justification also for a lot of the albums that are being released at the moment. There are albums that you can pick up on Discogs for ten p a copy that are being re-released, and it, it makes no real sense other than they're doing it on coloured vinyl, which seems to be a massive trend. So, so when you started doing it, playing playing Groovy and other small labels, it was quite a minority thing, wasn't it? Cottage industry oh, yeah. type thing. Because presumably the amount of places that can manufacture vinyl had just declined like crazy, hadn't it? They did, although they are opening up again. They now. are. Yeah. But yes, what, I mean, when I started, you you did a blog and you referred to it as plain crazy. Yeah, I did. Which still holds good. Which was so <laughs> funny. But but yes, it has. I mean, it's it's become very popular. Um, my broker has been amazing for the last 10 years, but I have to say. Um, we've got a really big, our biggest release coming out. So back in the day, we were pressing 500 copies of albums. Uh, since then, it's mostly been 300 to 500. Uh, big, big train have been very successful. And we went up to pressing 1,000. I've just ordered 2,200 copies of their new album, which is far and away the biggest. But I was very nervous because I've had to go with a different pressing solution. Because the best I could get from DMS was seven months from when I placed the order. So uh, seven I, months from you when you give them the months. tape and are uh, they... The well, seven, no, seven months from when their uh, artwork department, when, when we approve when we approve all the audio and the artwork, the proofs back as well. So seven months from seven there. Seven months, and now it's even longer. Uh, apparently, yeah. So I, it, I, I went on the hunt and I found a place in Belgium that I'm using. I was very nervous until the test pressings arrived two weeks ago. And they are amazing. So I'm very confident that this is one solution now. And they were offer, able to offer me four months. But when I went to them last week about another album, they're up to seven months as well. 
Because uh, the story that originally appeared in the in the trade press there was that the uh, Adele actually had to finish her record early in order to get it into the manufacture to be to be made a vinyl, which which is just an extraordinary idea, really. It's the tail wagging the dog, Completely isn't it? Completely tail wagging the dog. Yeah. I mean, do you think this will continue like this, or do you think you know in a couple of years' time all the Adeles and Ed Sheerans and their equivalents would have moved on <laughs> to something else and le- and left you alone to? You I'll know, tell you what, David, it's it, it's not only that, and it's not Brexit, and it's not shortage of lorry drivers. It, uh, apparently, the problem started with uh, you may recall uh, uh, the one of the only two lacquer factories in the world burnt down the year before last. Oh right! And that meant that a lot of people had to switch from lacquer mastering to direct metal mastering, uh, which <gasps> personally I prefer, and that limited some options. Um, and then there's uh, so the main pr- plant that I use, which is I think the biggest plant is certainly in Europe, is GZ, and they had to introduce. Um, social distancing measures at their plant, which meant their manpower drop, which meant their production rate drop. So so all of that got hit also by a couple of big releases. So I think things potentially have just been building up and building up. And packaging has been hit too, isn't it? I mean, cardboard, everything's been hit, isn't it? Okay, so so the big old ship in the Suez Canal apparently has caused chaos with all the shipping stuff. So so, um, PVC peanuts are delayed all over the place and uh, and, the... paper and card for making this i think apparently everything supply chains are are screwed at the moment it's it's a very difficult so if we look at the stuff behind you there chris where yeah. you're sitting there's loads of cds which are valueless but actually over in the other corner there's loads of cardboard which is probably worth a fortune <laughs> <laughs> i don't throw it away on burn it anymore <laughs> Story it, it for a rainy day. Yeah, well, look, Chris, lovely to talk to you. Good to keep in touch. All the very best. What's your next? Uh, what's your next playing groovy release? Well, the 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 big one coming up is the Big Big Train album, Welcome to the Planet, which will be here. They delayed the CD to tie in with the vinyl to make it a concurrent release. That's the end of January, and then a whole. But can I just say that the other there is one other issue for small people like me, which is I've got ten albums now in the system because the delays are so long. And you have to pay a load of money up front now, whereas when it used to be 10, 8 to 10 weeks, you would pay before delivery. I'm now having to pay a load up front. So there's a lot of money going out right? with no chance of return. So it's, it has made things that bit more difficult, for oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, well, well, all the very still best. Fun. Keep very best luck with it. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. So very sadly, uh, we've seen a lot of obituaries about um, about Maureen Cleave, who died uh, the other day um, at the age of 87, whose reputation was kind of sealed, really, made by uh, the piece she wrote, didn't she, in the Evening Standard on March the 4th, 1966. She had a brilliant headline. Headline was, How Does a Beetle Live? John Lennon Lives Like This, which is a great headline. Mm-hmm. And in that piece... Uh, you know, he famously said, uh, Christianity will go, it will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right and I'll be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity, which was then, wasn't it, six months later, kind of taken kind of out of context well, by it, American publication. It's really interesting, actually, because in the evening standard, it didn't raise much. <laughs> no, no, they didn't, they didn't Britain, pick up on those qu- in quotes. In Britain, you know, yeah. that's, people just take that sort of stuff. It was republished by an American magazine called Date Book, and Date Book was a, you know it didn't run for that long, but it was it was supposed to be for young people, but it did issues. That was Date Book's thing, you know. It was yeah. like a kind of like a teenage magazine program on the television. Let's talk about issues, you know, yeah. through pop music, and uh, they just bought it. They didn't think anything of it. Nobody thought anything was going to happen. They did pull up McCart- those quotes. Though, no, well, not they? particularly, actually, because yeah. if you look on the cover of Date Book, is it for a start? It's got Paul McCartney on the cover, not John Lennon, and uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the I think the cover line. I don't know the exact cover line, but it's it's something that I won't repeat because it, it's 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 racial. Actually, is the, is the kind of the edge that they yeah. come with, which is another quote from from John Lennon. It's not the Christianity thing. That just appeared. It was picked up by an American DJ down in the South who just decided to make a big I'm going to go for this. It was yeah. about, it was picked up by a station. It didn't even broadcast all day. It, it, it broadcast during the day and not in the evening. 
And you know what DJs are like? They're just looking for somebody to talk about for half an hour. And uh, and so he started going on about this. And this was then picked up by loads of other, other radio stations around the South. And next thing you knew, you had uh, you had burnings of uh, Beatles records. But uh, the, the thing, and I, I'm sorry, I, I, sorry, I'm droning on a bit about this, but I, I talk about this in my book about, about the British invasion, is that there was a part of American society that was looking to have a go back at Britain. And and there'd been such an embrace of the Beatles and all the British groups during yeah. the British invasion. Now the feeling was a few years later, these guys are coming over here, taking our money, that's it, and, and they're insulting our religion. Our religion, <laughs> and that's the interesting thing about American South. They sort of even think they invented Christianity. <laughs> they kind of think it's theirs. You know what I mean? And so he's got no right to talk about this kind of stuff. And so you got this incredible backlash. And they were trying to pop the Beatles balloon too. Oh, yeah. They were desperately trying to end this. It's got to stop. How can we end it? That's the new story. Yeah. But she wrote, I mean, she was a very significant writer for you know, for quite a long time. She's yeah. a, a really fascinating person. Yeah, My very goodness. much. She an amazing life, too. An extraordinary thing happened to her in 1940 when I think she was six. She was six years older than Lennon, who she was big mates. She's big mates with all of In fact, Lennon hid out in her flat, didn't he, when he, yeah, when yeah. he split when up he with left Cynthia. Cynthia yeah. But an extraordinary thing happened. She was on a, on a ship going to India with her mum and her sister, which was torpedoed, and she spent five hours in a lifeboat waiting to be rescued. Extraordinary. Yeah. And then she went with the Beatles to, to the Ed Sullivan show. She, um, yeah, she been big, big friends with all of them. And then wrote that extraordinary piece, which you can still find online. That I was just reading it this morning. It's an amazing profile because it talks about what you really want to know, which is what kind of life do they live? There they are imprisoned by their celebrity. Yeah. And she goes to Weybridge and talks about the art and the books and the objects and the furniture and all in the place and all incredible detail and, and how they spend their evenings. And they're mostly Len and, and Ringo and George are, are sort of neighbours. They often come around and they just watch telly and play board games. And there's a lovely bit here where she's talking about Lennon. It's so beautifully described. She says, Lennon was easygoing but tough, uh, just like Henry VIII, imperious, unpredictable, indolent, disorganised, childish, vague, charming and quick-witted. Yeah. That's a fantastically astute profile, don't you think? No, very definitely. The 1966, that's extraordinary, piercing analysis. Yeah. And, the, and she kind of was one of the architects for that new form of pop writing. Although, you know, there were, people say there were, there were very few women at the time. Actually, it was Penny Valentine, wasn't there? There were quite a Annie lot. Nightingale. People, people say this. They all say, oh, they, you know, they were real pioneers. Well, yeah, they were, but there were quite a few of them, you know, that yeah, the women McGowan. were very significant in all this. And, you know, the other person, who, who a very different style, but around about the same time as Gloria Stavers in the States, who started 16 magazine, or was the kind of, the leading life 16 magazine, you know, so the so uh, women were very much at the forefront of, of, of that whole thing. And they very often got interviews that, you know, they, they would be invited to the house rather, you know, in a way that they probably wouldn't have invited blokes. No, absolutely. From, uh, you know, from, and they got the stuff out of people. There's an incredible outtake you can find on YouTube of her. It's, it's an outtake from uh, Don't Look Back. Um, the the Penna Baker Dylan documentary, and it's her interviewing Dylan with a load of other journalists. It's fantastic, and Dylan clearly is besotted with her. Right, he's flirting with her desperately yeah. all the way through because she was super looking, wasn't she? Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so yeah, she uh, oh, she was really original and had an incredible life. It's so post, story. yeah, it's an extraordinary story. If you read the full old bit, which I think was in the Times last week, and then there's one in the Guardian, I think today, um, that you know post. Being a writer, she she kind of married in the aristocracy, didn't she? Yeah, she, was, she did. <laughs> she became lived in a sort of minor stately home in Essex. I yeah, think. it was fascinating life. Anyway, Brilliant life. Maureen and Cleave. on a Beatles tip, did you notice that George Harrison's house is up for sale? Oh right, George Harrison's old childhood. Childhood. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, twenty-five Upton Green. Uh, which is where he and uh, you know the quarrymen and all that used to used to rehearse, you know, and uh, yeah, it was it was bought seven years ago for one hundred and fifty six thousand by a Beatles fan. It would almost certainly sell to another Beatles fan. Quite interesting that fans do occasionally buy houses. Kurt Cobain's childhood home in Washington is owned by a fan. Uh, Dylan, there's a big Dylan fan called Bill Pagel who, who owns two of. He's got the Dylan's childhood home from Hibbing, and also the home in Duluth. Um, 
Tittenhurst Park, interesting. We sold to the President of the United Arab Emirates. <laughs> it's the kind of person who could afford it. <laughs> but the, I, what I was fascinated by, I discovered that you can rent Big, P, Big Pink. Did you know I, this? And you were telling me this. Yeah, very Big exciting. Pink. A couple of really enterprising, kind of hippie-ish couple bought it in 1998. And they kind of, they rent it out. Um, very reasonably, I think. You don't get the basement, which, of course, is the is the key part of it. But you can go and rent Big big Pink for about, I don't know, $700 a night or whatever. And uh, you can also rent the flat that the, well, no, in fact, the whole house that contains the flat in 39 Stanhope Gardens in Crouch End, Highgate, where Pink Floyd used to used to rehearse. And it struck me that was a really good idea, waiting to happen, wasn't it? Rockstar Airbnb. It rockstar so Airbnb. Up, you buy really up the home, you know, Dylan's house in Woodstock or Haddon Hall. You buy Haddon Hall. Yes. Place, I don't think he's still there. Out. Is it no, still probably there? not there, actually. Your Fairport Convention, the Fairport House is still, uh, that still exists, isn't it? Where, where Fairport convened. Uh, <laughs> The tra- the house where traffic used to play, I can't remember what it was called now, in Aston Tyrold. Aston Tyrold. Yes, and yeah. there was one. Well, Led Zeppelin had that. Uh, was it called Bronny Yaw? That little cottage that they 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 rented. In, I, in, I in think Wales. that is still there. I see. Wouldn't that, that be brilliant? Imagine if you owned that, you could rent that out. Surely, yeah. the top dollar for yeah. people who want to just drink in the Led Zeppelin vibe. It's brilliant. <laughs> so funny talking of Haddon Hall and David Bowie. I was talking to somebody the other day who told me his son, who's like nineteen, is at leaving university, wants to go and uh, and they currently live in Seven Oaks. Uh, yeah. Wants to go and live in Camden Town and make it in the music, <laughs> crack the music scene. I said, just tell him David Bowie did all his most interesting work when he was living in Beckenham. Just yeah. stay there. Yeah. Stay there. Use the inspiration of the suburbs. Nothing good comes of Camden Town, my lad. <laughs> the Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink and it's like being in the pub. Here we are. Um, you're the regular. You're our Graham Norton correspondent, Mark Allen. Uh, yeah, that's what you're usually watching off a Friday night with the good lady wife. Um, something. I love the Graham Norton show. <laughs> so, last night, sensation because it had Lady Gaga on it too, who's always hilarious, you know. But no, the, the the weird thing was was Rod Stewart. Rod Stewart appeared with an all girl band, you know, right. obviously as a kind of attempt to look fabulously in <laughs> vogue but the all-girl band were i don't know how you put this but that, I, I, they had that kind of what well, i think in the 70s it's called dolly birds right, you know okay I mean? right right they, they, they had these kind of skimpy dresses and these little high right. heels and they they were kind of they, they all had blonde hair and there was a banjo player pretending to play the banjo and somebody playing pretend to play a violin and a drummer and three backing vocals and it just looked faintly absurd and it just looked like it was trying terribly hard to be to terribly terribly cool and uh and it, it came across rot- i thought it came across bad and so I rod how old is rod how old's rod now what's two what he's 74 <laughs> at least, he's he's at least. yeah 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 you know so he's kind of he's now older than the character that clive dunn played in dad's army you know, that's right. That's he's right. Still, he's still flouncing around, yeah, yeah. surrounded by models. Yeah, they're models. They look like 70s models. They're I'm really a model. Weird. I'm yeah. a model. <laughs> anyway, questions from the massive. Uh, some very good ones, particularly Lucas Hare, our old friend Lucas Hare, says, which celebrities, and here, here, Rod's name may, may come up again. What celebrities is it acceptable to refer to by only their first name? Oh right! That's now good. Rod is a case. Rod's you a case. Would, oh, you, can. you would call talk about Rod. Yeah. You would. Whereas talking about Stuart, where no, nobody would know what you meant. But Rod, there is only one Rod, isn't there? I don't think there is. Any, I mean, you're not going to confuse him with Rod Argent. There's Rod. Really. There's Elton. Yeah. There's El Rod Elton. There's so Sting, it, but then Sting was always called Sting, so he always only had one name. Keith, Keith, Keith. one name, but not Mick. Yeah, Not Ron. Me. There's Ron, possibly. Uh, Van, yes. Yep. Uh, in the news again. <laughs> Van spending slightly oh, more time Lord. with, with my learned friends than oh, he would probably like. He's probably... going to be on the thick end of a very hard-hitting lawsuit, isn't he, I think? <laughs> a cliff, cliff, obviously. Cliff, yeah. But generally speaking, to respond to your question, Lucas, I, I tend to believe that the English way to do it is to give people's full name. Whereas calling them in that mating fashion by their first name 
always seems to be a thing that Americans do. Americans talk about Bruce, don't they? As if yeah. as if they kind of know him themselves, yeah. you know. And um, they'll do that about loads of people. Uh, whereas I, I, might, I always tend to refer to people by their full name, really. Um, but no, there are there are cases. It was very interesting watching uh, Graham Norton last night interviewing Lady Gaga because <clears throat> there is no abbreviation for Lady Gaga. There you go. You can't call a lady. You can't call a Gaga. That's so true. You have to call a Lady Gaga. In fact, can... the week before, the, or a couple of weeks ago, he interviewed uh, Springsteen and Barack Obama, and he had to call Barack Obama Mr. President. Uh, which is interesting because he's not actually the president, but you know he called him Mr. O- they called him President Obama. You re- he couldn't call him Barack. But don't you remain? Him- don't you remain re- entitled to being called president? Uh, maybe for that's the rest it, of your I life. Think I think him, you do. I think he called him President Obama throughout. So, so, you're say, a, so you're Bruce, tell us state, about so and so, and then he would say, "And President Obama, what do you think?" And it sounded so extraordinary, as it did with Lady Gaga, because he could talk to you know Adam Driver, her, her co-star in the movie, and call him Adam. But you know, but so, so Lady Gaga, what do you think? So now here's a question: I wonder why. And now you've spent some time in her orbit, so you may know the answer to this question. What do the people in the in the immediate retinue of Lady Gaga? Call her when well, she's out of the, the room. Well, some of the people around her, when I interviewed her, they called her the Garg. But, uh, you know, the, you, Garg. Again, you, the Garg, I think. So, but you can't really call her the Garg on a live television program because it implies a no, I, absolutely, dating yeah. intimacy. That no, I'm just interested don't when, when they ring up each other in the evening and go, you'll never guess you'll never what guess she's, what she's asked, only but... gone and done now. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> what, do they, what the what Garg's gone and say? done. I know, I know. Steve Litchfield says he was thinking the other day how we have hundreds of hours of footage of bands playing live from since about 1980, 10,000 hours of bands since, since 2000, thanks to YouTube, and yet only minutes of footage of many 1970s and 1960s bands. I think that's absolutely true. Um, you know, because nowadays you just assume that any performance will be recorded won't it? just yeah. somehow it'll be on somebody's phone or it'll be on telly or it'll be done by a fan or whatever but this was the thing that you know when i spoke to peter jackson about the um the beatles film in a piece which appear in the radio times next week get a copy <laughs> one of the things he said was he couldn't believe that there was footage of any 60s band let alone Re- rehearsing and, yeah. uh, and uh, absolute fly on the wall, let alone the idea that it was it's the, the Beatles. Beatles and that they're writing songs that have become yeah. immortal. It's yeah, that it's not, it's not Dave D. Dozy I know, you can teach. it's not the new seekers, it's the Beatles for God's sake doing that. They say it's absolutely true. What, it's what true. Steve so is saying. Little. So little. I remember when the Amy Winehouse, first Amy Winehouse documentary came out, I remember thinking how extraordinary it was that virtually everything she'd done had been recorded. Yeah. Everything. And whether it was even just voice voice uh, mail messages or a lot of the time it was her with her camera. She'd go on holiday and she'd then, with her iPhone, she'd film herself walking around the flat she'd rented and talking about it. You know, so everything existed on film. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's so much easier to make a documentary now. Christ. Yeah. Blue Mountain wanted to know what we thought of the map of, of England divided up into regions where, with, have you seen this, Mark? I've only where, just seen it, yes. Where they, uh, with their, their most uh, notable, Center, yeah. notable uh, musical export. And, uh, you know, so you get, you get around London, you get Elton John. And then if you look yeah, up. Yeah, Cornwall in, is Aphex Twin, isn't it? <laughs> is it? Yeah. Oh, yes, it is. Apex Twin, and then and then Devon is Muse. That's right. Moving up, I suppose that's Somerset, isn't it? Tears for Fears, and uh, you know, moving along. But it's got some curious things, as Blue Mountain says. That I think the biggest export, according to this, of Ca- from Cambridgeshire, is is Olivia Newton John. That's right. As, as he says, I it will probably. Be, well, no, she's born in born in Cambridge. Oh, okay. And um, and uh, but it, he, as he says. He or she says, "Sorry, I, I'm assuming I know the I know the the gender of Blue Mountain. Um, it, it ought to be Pink Floyd, surely. Surely the biggest musical export of um, of Cambridge. Now, Olivia Newton John, born in Cambridge, born and brought up in Cambridge. Father, very distinguished character in, in, in during the war, very distinguished war service, I think. And I'll tell you this funny little story." 
I used, when I used to freelance for sounds in about 1978 or something, and uh, Olivia Newton John was absolutely um, the biggest thing in the world, you know, Greece and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> Olivia Neutron Bomb, as she was known in the press. Sounds <laughs> sounds around a cover line. It's my, one of my favourite uh, cover line teasers. It was uh, My Naked Bath Nights with Olivia Newton-John by Sound Scribe, see page four or whatever. And you went, and there was huge Hugh Fielder. Hugh used to be the news editor of Sound. Oh, yes! That's He'd right. grown up next door to yes. her in Cambridge. And so he had pictures of her in the backyard with the two of them, like three year olds. Yeah. Naked, <laughs> sporting in some paddling pool or whatever. I thought that was really good. That's idea. very funny. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. James, James Wilkinson wants to know which band has made the most out of a relatively short and somewhat unprolific career. I suggest Roxy Music, eight studio albums, but uh, 10 times that in live albums and best of compilations, recycling, a comparatively. Stone small Roses, number, small number of songs. Stone Roses, Stone Roses, surely one really good record, one slightly patchy record. That's uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but still, if they came back tomorrow and said they were playing Wembley Arena, there'd be an absolute stampede. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Darren Leithley wants us to discuss musicians' working hours. Um, you know, are, are musicians essentially shift workers? You know, that they kind of, they sleep during the day and they play during the evening. I suppose so when they're working, uh, Darren. But the interesting thing we found in the last year or so during the pandemic, we were setting up all these word in your attic chats with people. And as as you note, you know, we we do, we tend to start quite early, you know, because we, which is Mark and we I. We start at nine in the morning usually. Mark, so, yeah. We start earlier. Mark and yeah. I have, you know, we've, we've had children. And so the habit of lying in has been completely bred out of us over the over the years. Whereas Alex can still sleep in all day if, if it's required. But anyway, we set up uh, interviews with people. And we say, do you mind doing it? Like nine in the morning and whatever. And, and then most people are fine, but musicians go, all what? Music- but the thing is that musicians can't be seen to be with novelists, of course, because they get up at six and I'm already, you know, I'm already, uh, you know, hacking away at the, at, the, at the laptop. But musicians, it looks uncool to think you're available at nine o'clock in the morning, even when it's lockdown and you're not doing anything apart from going to bed at nine the night before. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. And- 